Hi, church family. Hope you're staying warm and safe. Up here at the church, it is, the wind is blowing the snow sideways. So, uh, happy March in New Mexico, everyone. Today we're in Luke chapter 19, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 27. This is Jesus' journey into Jerusalem. We're getting close to uh, Jesus' death and resurrection on Easter in two weeks. And Jesus is going to encounter a man named Zacchaeus. My reading of this text shifted dramatically this week as a result of what happened in Bible study and my own reading of the text and my own research into it. So there are a couple ways to read this story, and we'll get into that in a minute. So let's hear. Jesus entered Jericho, and he was passing through it. Remember just a minute, he, a minute ago, he had healed a blind man outside of Jericho. So now he's inside. And a man there was named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because Jesus was going to pass that way. Now someone pointed out, if you're a prominent, if you're the chief tax collector and a wealthy person, it is unlikely that if you were really proud and looked down on people, that you would climb a tree like a child to see Jesus. This is a clue that Zacchaeus may actually be a humble person. Right? He's not afraid to embarrass himself uh, so that he can see Jesus. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and he was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Now, there's actually nothing in this text, or very little, that, to suggest that Zacchaeus was a sinner, that Zacchaeus extorted people or that he was rude. In fact, there are a lot of clues that he was an incredibly generous person, including his name, which someone pointed out in Bible study, means innocent. So what if Zacchaeus... I mean, he has a job that folks don't appreciate uh, because he collects their taxes. And he's probably been rejected by his community as a result. But what if he's a really good guy? And we'll hear that in a minute. Zacchaeus stood there and he said, Master, look, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Here's a footnote that's interesting. All right, in my Bible, which is the New Interpreter Study Bible, here's what it says. Does Zacchaeus repent? As this translation seems to imply, right? I will give to the poor. If I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay it back. As in like, wow, I just met Jesus and now my whole life is going to change and I'll, I'll adjust my behavior. Or... Does Zacchaeus sketch for Jesus his characteristic behavior? My habit is to give. My habit is to pay back. In Greek, the present tense verb could be read either way. In fact, the whole episode could be taken as Jesus restoring to the community of God's people a person who had been excluded by that community on account of his vocation. Different way to read the story. So then Jesus says to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. So, again, we often hear in some Christian circles that being lost means that you haven't found Christ, that there's something wrong with you, and we pray for the lost souls. Um, or it could mean, like the lost sheep or the lost coin, that Zacchaeus is incredibly valuable and uh, that he's been discarded in some way. Or, you know, maybe it's not Zacchaeus' fault, but it's the fault of the community who rejected him. Salvation, which comes from the same root as salve, healing, has many different meanings. I grew up in a church where we were taught that salvation meant that Jesus died for our sins, and so that we can go to heaven because Jesus paid for all our crimes. 
sort of a legalistic interpretation, like we were on trial for all of our sin, Jesus steps in, and so we get to go free and Jesus pays the price instead. It's called substitutionary atonement, uh, and that's one theory of salvation and one theory of the cross. It is not universally what's believed by all Christians. This is another version of salvation, which is Jesus showing up among us, that that is healing, that that is salvific, that Zacchaeus is liberated by the presence of Jesus, either through his repentance, if he was a repentant sinner, or on the other hand, he was restored to community by being in the presence of someone who said, I love you, you are a beloved child of God, even though the rest of your community says that you should be an outcast and they bully you and, and treat you like an outcast. And that's another variation of what salvation might mean in the life and teaching, death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, I'm going to do a video series on that and I'll see if I can link it in the midweek message. That's my plan anyway, but Holy Week is coming up. We'll see what happens. Let's continue now. This next parable is uh, the parable of the pounds. A pound here is about three months wages. And this parable um, in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark is slightly different. In Matthew, it seems to be encouraging people to invest their time and money and that God will multiply those gifts and they'll get that in return. Um, in Mark, it's actually more about be aware the master could return at any minute. In Luke, there's something different. And the clue we get is from verse 11. It says, as they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So there are two things going on. First, they're about to enter Jerusalem. Second of all, they have expectations that may not be met. Jesus is giving them a heads up that there's something about to happen that they don't anticipate. And one person who studied this text extensively spoke up in Bible study and talked about this actually being a warning to the disciples about what leadership and what the reign of powerful rulers in Jerusalem looks like in contrast to what we just read about Zacchaeus, who was a generous man, either had always been generous or chose to be generous after encountering Jesus. So that's one type of community leadership that's based around connections, right? Um, being fair with people, uh, not being too proud, climbing a tree so that you can see Jesus and not worrying that people will think you're ridiculous and probably make fun of you for doing something a child would do, right? Although, by the way, I think climbing trees is great. I wouldn't judge you. I would applaud you. Uh-oh, uh <laughs> uh that's my phone ringing. I'll be right back. Okay. So this may be a warning about what to expect when it comes to Jerusalem's leadership and an invitation to make a choice. Do we choose leadership like Zacchaeus's or do we choose leader uh, to follow leaders like the one that we're about to hear about in this story? So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to get royal power for himself, then return. He summoned 10 of his slaves and he gave them 10 pounds. And he said to them, do business with these till I come back. But the citizens of his country hated him. So he was not a well-liked ruler. I don't know that we've had any of those in recent history. Um, okay. Listen, whatever side of the political aisle you're on, I'm sure you can think of a leader that is not universally well-liked and that is more ego-centered than other-centered. And that's this kind of ruler. So do business with, these, you know, with this money until I come back. But the citizens hated him and they sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this ruler to rule over us. So he's going, to be clear, he's going to try to take power somewhere else. And his own people send a delegation. It would be like writing a, a really bad review online and saying, no, 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 no. You do not want to work with this guy. He's awful. But apparently they were not successful because it says when he returned, having received royal power, he ordered his slaves to whom he had given the money 
to be summoned so that he might find out what they had gained by trading. The first came forward and said, Master, your pound has made ten more pounds. He said to him, Well done, good slave, because you've been trustworthy in a small thing, take charge of ten cities. Then the second came, Lord, your pound has made five pounds. He said to him, And you rule over five cities. Then the other came, said, Master, here's your pound. I wrapped it up in a piece of cloth because I was afraid of you. Because you're a harsh man, you take what you didn't deposit and you reap what you didn't sow. And he said to him, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked slave. You knew, did you, that I was a harsh man, taking what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow? Why then did you not put my money in the bank? Then when I returned, I could have collected it with interest. He said to the bystanders, take the pound from him and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. All right, so not only is he speaking harshly to this servant, but he's humiliating him in front of other people. So they said to him, but master, this other man already has 10 pounds. And he said, I tell you, all of those who have, more will be given. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. So those who were disloyal to this disliked ruler were then punished in a very public way. So I, I do think there might be something to what the person talked about in Bible study about this being a warning to the disciples and Jesus saying, if you follow me into Jerusalem, you think that I'm just going to show up and poof, everything is going to be fine. But this is what we're contending with. It's not all going to happen at once. There are wicked people who are doing awful things. They're proud. They have power. They're hurtful. They humiliate people. And they still acquire power. So just, just be aware. Um, it's, it's not the most uplifting text. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot here. On Sunday, it's Palm Sunday, Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which is always a triumphal entry I feel like with where we're also holding our breath because we know what's coming next um, and it's also Jesus's confrontation with the reality um, of just how corrupt and um, how corrupt the power structures are in Jerusalem at that time uh, and it, it hurts it hurts him to witness that so this is where he'll um, cleanse the temple and weep over Jerusalem. And uh, we will read that on Sunday. And also talk about, yeah, there are no palms in Luke, but we'll still have palms and sing Hosanna. <laughs> uh, they use cloaks in Luke. So there you go. I will see you on Sunday. I look forward to taking this journey with you. This is the toughest part of it. So, um, but it also makes the resurrection so much more meaningful when we participate in this journey. Make sure to tune in Thursday night, Maundy Thursday at 6 p.m. We will be sharing some hymns and scripture and a meal together. So bring, bring your dinner and come join us and we'll celebrate communion on Thursday night as well. And then on Friday at noon, we will tell the story of the Passion, which is the story of Jesus' betrayal and death. Uh, it's a painful story, it's a violent one, but it, it also uh, prepares us for the joy of the resurrection and Jesus' triumph over death. I will see you then.